Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Ellie Knows Rocks, and you caught me talking about rocks. <laughs> this is a new series that I have one cut, or no cuts. This is just straight feed. What you see is what you get, and this is what we're talking about. So, today, we are talking about Galena. Hoping you can see it there. Anyways, Galena is a lead sulfide mineral. It is formed usually in hydrothermal veins by hot fluid that is pushing its way up to the surface, uh, often associated with scarn deposits. And a scarn is just a rock that has been metamorphically altered by hot heat fluid. And then it the recrystallizes into a different rock. And these beautiful lead sulfide I guess chunks or massive bits form with it. <clears throat> uh, galena is often associated with pyrite, quartz, fluorite, and sphalerite, which is pretty cool. Um, it has about a 2.5 hardness. It's got a gray streak, of course, that metallic luster. It's extremely heavy. Um, and of course, being a lead ore or a lead sulfite, it has been mined for centuries for its lead properties uh, also just for how beautiful it is people love its crystal habit and its structure it has a perfect cleavage three different sides at 90 degrees and you can kind of see it right oh can you though? right here so you see that beautiful bit which is pretty cool sticking up Anyways, I found this one in a mine in Arizona, and it was in a copper porphyry, and that specific porphyry was known for having a lot of metal sulfide veins, which means that the minerals that were forming inside of them were a metal and a sulfide, such as either iron or lead or something else. This one particularly doesn't have any sphalerite associated with it. I'm looking. Sphalerite, when it is with Galena specifically can have almost a a yellow iridescent sheen to it or or it, it's almost translucent which is really neat it's a very pure form of of sphalerite but since it is usually associated with pyrite this piece of pyrite actually has some quartz with it as well as little bits of Galena which I don't know if you're going to be able to see in there but it's almost pretty cubic, which is pretty cool. I mean, I, I get fascinated with this type of stuff just because it's, it's beautiful. I think that a lot of people love Galena because of the little, uh, or of, because of the cleavage planes that it has. One of the interesting things about these particular crystals is they twin. And so you can see the steps in the cleavage right in here. And so you'll get a long version and then you'll get like this step down that looks like it's almost the same thing that's coming off the crystal. That's its twin. Isn't that neat? So I'm always fascinated by these just because of how absolutely pretty they are. Now the books, as you're talking about them, they say some pretty crazy things. I mean, this is a massive mineral. Otherwise, I mean, you can get its cubic form, which, uh, you know, both of those are s semi common. The massive version that cleaves like this is the most common version. And then you can get like perfect, um, like pyramidal type crystals. I forgot the name of them, but let me see if it says what they are in the book. Uh, it says less occurrence of octahedral crystals. But then one of the wild things is. And I didn't know this actually until I read it, is that it says that it can actually form in a fibrous habit. Never seen that. I've been around a lot of metal sulfide veins and I've never seen that type of habit in Galena before. Um, this one is associated with the host rock. It's still attached to it down here. Like I said before, it was found in a porphyry in Arizona. And there's a lot of quartz, a lot of feldspar in the host rock. What else can I say about you? Other than it's really pretty, it's really heavy. 
and I like them a lot. Uh, the books, of course, each one. Uh, I can like hold them up here. Ooh. They're all gonna say a little bit something different about them. Ooh about the mineral. If you want to find any of these books, I think I have them all linked on uh, like the Amazon store that just because I want you guys to be able to use what I use. Um, I, when I first started out, I started out using all of these geology books or I guess mineral rock books religiously. It was something that I always looked at, always went to for a resource and found fascinating because I could find the facts at my fingertips. But they don't all tell you the same exact thing, which is pretty frustrating. Some of them leave them out. Some of them will talk about, uh, you know, they, they all tell you that, you know, they're a lead sulfide, not a problem. So it's, it's PDS. And, oh, that's funny. Saying that out loud, PBS. Didn't think about it before. Anyways, um, they, they tell you about like, Sometimes their habits, sometimes their physical properties, and sometimes the environment. But some of them will give you very little information and just show, um, I'm going to show you, Whoop. some some cool pictures. And I'm, I'm holding a, a Mojo Adventures card <laughs> as my placeholder. Oh, hey, guys. Um, anyways, so they'll just give you pictures with very little words, or they will, you know, give you several paragraphs about the mineral. So the books are important if you are learning about each and every one of these. I really appreciate them, especially if you're new to minerals. Now, I wouldn't just take one of the books as gospel, this is it, because they're not going to have all the information there. That's the only frustrating part. That's why I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of them. And I'm pretty sure I have a couple more in the house, not even including my actual college textbooks that I still have. Nerd. Anyways, so thank you guys for watching. You caught me talking about rocks, and I'll see you on the next one.